Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study with the Greater Hind Street Missionary Baptist Church. And we trust that you're having a, a safe and pleasant evening. We know that uh, we have uh, uh, bad weather that's uh, lurking about, and we pray that you're being safe and secure wherever you are. So, but uh, nevertheless, we must go forward with the study of, of God's Word. And uh, we trust that. Um, that wherever you are, you're also practicing social distancing and remaining spiritually connected. That's why we are here uh, tonight. And uh, we uh, uh, will be studying 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Uh, we have uh, concluded those love chapters uh, where uh, Paul was answering the question of the, uh, of the Corinthian church that 12th chapter, the 13th chapter, and the 14th chapter, they were interconnected because uh, this church was a gifted church. However, they had gotten their priorities mixed up and they were uh, coveting uh, the uh, gifts that were, that were not as profitable. Uh, and so, uh, but tonight we are uh, just so happy to deal with this 15th chapter of 1st Corinthian, which is considered uh, the great resurrection chapter. And uh, uh, in studying this and preparing for this presentation, uh, it has certainly opened my eyes even further. And we uh, trust that you too, uh, in pursuit of a deeper knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, let us go forth uh, with our uh, lesson today. We're going to, let, let's pray and then we'll go, move forward. God, our Father, uh, we come in the precious name of Jesus, our Christ, uh, thanking you for your tender mercies and your watchful care. Uh, as we study, O oh God, your word, you said uh, in your word that we are to study to show ourselves approved, a uh, workman unto God that needed not to be ashamed, but rightly divide the word of truth. Uh, we thank you so much uh, for this time uh, of sharing, even in the midst of uh, this uh, stormy Wednesday. Um, as we study tonight, um, in chapter 15 of this, uh, most powerful, of this powerful gospel, uh, we will, uh, again, this is the great resurrection chapter. Uh, Paul was, um, uh, teaching the, uh, this uh, this church, this this uh, uh, this gifted church, and they had some questions uh, that they posed to Paul. There was questions uh, regarding the resurrection of the dead, the resurrection of the dead, and so um, uh, he is seeking to answer these questions uh, because. Uh, uh, some teachers had entered into uh, the congregation and had given them some false information. Uh, and so uh, they were, what they were doing, in essence, they were denying the uh, possibility of the resurrection. Uh, they did not deny the fact that uh, there was a life after death, uh, but uh, suggested uh, that uh, they would uh, that the body was uh, housing the soul, so the soul was a prisoner of the body, and as a result of being a prisoner of the body, then uh, it was defiled, and that death would uh, release the uh, the spirit, the, uh, and so as a result, it would give them um, uh, the freedom that they uh, that they, they they saw. And this was part of the teaching. Now, um, when we look further into uh, this, this, this masterpiece, this great work, um, uh, we want to seek to uh, deal with some of these questions concerning the resurrection of the dead. And what we want to do tonight is to uh, uh, really focus on the first 11 verses and perhaps we'll be able to go forward into... Uh, the uh, verses following, but these uh, the questions that that we want to ask and answer that was 
posed, that were posed by uh, the church. And uh, number one, uh, when we look at the argument, the first argument that he uh, that he made, uh, Paul dealt with, since you have these issues regarding the resurrection, uh, he's going to deal with, number one, the proof of the believer's resurrection, the very proof of it. And he used so much logic, even uh, like he, his, pattern, his, his pattern in writing and uh, dealing with the churches, he uh, would go back to the Old Testament. And uh, because the New Testament had not been uh, written, had, was not completed. And as a result, uh, they were students. Uh, they were uh, followers of the Mosaic Law and, uh, and also the prophets. And so what he would do, uh, he would uh, use what they believed in, or uh, they said that they believed in, and he would reach back and get the Old Testament foundation and bring them, marry them into this new arrangement since Jesus Christ had come and, and started uh, a new relationship, a new dispensation of grace. And so he intermingled those so as to authenticate, uh, in this instance, uh, the resurrection. And so uh, the, the arguments then that he made, the proof of the resurrection, he gave historical proof, number one. He gave historical proof of the resurrection. And uh, not only historical proof, uh, but secondly, he gave personal proof. The historical proof again and personal proof. That is his experience after having met uh, the risen Christ and, uh, and ascended Christ on the Damascus road. I met him. I was one that came out of due season. I did not walk the shores uh, with uh, the master. I did not walk the dusty roads of Palestine, nor was I one who... Uh, was on the ship with him, nor was I the one who uh, were at Jairus' house on Mount of Transfiguration or the seaside cemetery where this uh, Gadarene man who was out of his mind and possessed with demon. I was not with him uh, during, those, uh, during those times, but I'm one who was born out of due season, to be born out of these due season. I'm one who it's like uh, not born before nine months, but I'm one that came in an immature fashion. I'm the one who uh, came as a result of uh, abortion in a sense. Uh, uh, I did not go the full term out, out of normal situation. I was born out of due season, out of due time. And so that was the personal proof. And then not only that, uh, he said that was the doctrinal proof. This is the overview now. Uh, there was doctrinal proof of, uh, of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Doctrine, I'm going to prove that to you. By doctrine, that is, and deal with the two Adams. That is, uh, the first Adam and the second Adam, as you well know. But not only that, but I will have practical proof. That would be practical proof that I'm going to show you. Uh, this is because... Again, as I told you on last week, that if you're going to make saints, you got to make sense. And too often, we don't make saints because we don't make sense. We have to make sense of it. And so this is what he sought to do uh, in uh, dealing with this great, what we call, resurrection uh, chapter. And so uh, I'm going to read a, a couple of the verses just to get us acclimated. Uh, well, let, let me, I'm going to read the first, uh, uh, let's first three verses. Uh, he's saying now, this is his first argument. Uh, uh, number one uh, of chapter 15, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. I've already preached it. I preached this when I uh, came and established this church and stayed here for about 18 months. And I, uh, well, I established the church. 
And I worked for a living as a tent maker. I didn't even ask you to support my ministry. I did it on my own by working with uh, some tent making couples. Uh, and then uh, he says in verse 2, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you. I preached it unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. You said you believed it. So if you believed in vain, if you didn't really believe it, you just you made your mouth say, uh, and it was not a hard matter, then certainly there is, uh, 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 you will question uh, anything that is Christological, anything that is Christ-based. And so, uh, and then he says in verse, uh, uh, in verse three, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that, and this is past tense now, delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. I received it uh, from Christ himself. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. According to the scriptures. And then uh, let me read verse 4 and then we're going to go back and talk about that a bit. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. And the scripture is Holy Ghost breathed. It is the scriptures were written by, by writers under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So the, the, the scriptures is the, the inerrant word of God. And so then uh, this is the importance of the gospel. This is the importance of the gospel. And what does the gospel mean? Corinthians, church, those who are watching, what does the gospel mean? The gospel means the good news. It means the good news. There is only one gospel, but now, now but the gospel, uh, and this is this is for you to be mindful of because sometimes those will try to play on words and deal with uh, semantics, so to speak, have verbal gymnastic as it relates to words to twist them. And so, there's only one gospel. But it is described in different ways. Sometimes it is called the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom of God, meaning the same. The gospel of the grace of God, the same. The gospel of God, the gospel of Christ, the same. The glorious gospel, the everlasting gospel. So then he says this is the importance of that, of the good news is that you have received it. This is past tense. When I was here and established it, you received it. That's why we received those gifts that we talked about in 1 Corinthians 12. And so the Holy Spirit uh, uh, came and then visit, gave gifts to, to all of you in the church. And that's why you were able uh, to do what you, 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 you did by speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues and the gifts of healing, the gifts of faith and prophesying and all of the gifts. And you received it. You're proof of it. And not so you received it. And so you, since you received it, number two, stand in it. Stand in it. Don't let these naysayers and false teachers come about and try to get you sidetracked because that's the devil will always try to, to uh, throw you off and he will always deal with with a counterfeit, to counterfeit to cause doubt. And so since, since that has happened, you have received it, stand in it, because you are saved by it. So if you hold fast, all you have to do is to hold fast to it. If you hold fast to it, and, and if your belief is not in vain, then you are standing on the solid rock. You're standing on the solid rock. And then not only that, but, uh, and, and when we look at, at, verse, at verse 3 here, Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. He died for our sins according to the scripture. And then, and also, and another fact is that Christ was buried and arose according to the scripture. And you use scripture to 
uh, to, to prove scripture. You will always find a scripture that will cross-reference uh, the scripture that you are studying because you, uh, you can prove the scripture by the scripture. Not anybody's opinion of anything of this sort, but by the scripture. That's how we will know. And so, uh, and then that Christ rose from the, from the, from the dead. And that's also, in, in, uh, he would go back into the Old Testament. Look at Isaiah. Uh, look at Isaiah uh, 53. Look at Isaiah 53. And um, let's see. Okay. Yeah. And let's start at five. But he was wounded. This is Isaiah talking about Jesus. He's looking through the, that great prognosticator, looking through the telescope of time. He says, but he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we're healed. But then look at what he says. Uh, all... All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Of us all. And then but look at, but skip down to verse 9. This deals with the, with, uh, uh, the, the, the work where we're dealing with tonight. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. That's awesome. And then not only that, uh, let's look at Psalms uh, 16. Uh, yeah, Psalm 16 and 9. Uh, Psalm 16 and 9. There are no chapters now in Psalms. Psalms 16 and 9 is all we need to say. Psalms and Numbers. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And so this is, uh, uh, he uses Old Testament scripture to help convince uh, the, uh, this church of um, uh, of the resurrection of Christ. And then uh, there's another fact. He says there were eyewitnesses. There were eyewitnesses. At beginning at, at verse 5, um, he says that a proof of his resurrection. And because he's the first fruit of the resurrection. And he says, and that he was seen of Cephas. And you know Cephas, that's Peter, who he called the rock. Uh, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. Didn't see all the twelve at one time and in different places, but here he's saying seen of the twelve, not necessarily that they were in a group, but he was seen of the twelve uh, at one point in the group, but uh, after the resurrection, you know, he told the women to tell my disciples and Peter to meet me in Galilee, to meet me. And so uh, he was seen of the twelve after the resurrection. And so this further proves it. And so that, uh, and after that, he was seen of uh, above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, uh, but some are fallen asleep. And so he was seen of Peter. Isn't that amazing? How awesome God is. The one who denied him the most, that's who saw him. That's who he saw, seen of, of, of Cephas. Uh, and then, uh, and James saw him also, and the apostle saw him again. Uh, because, you know, keep in mind that the church was confused about the resurrection of, of the believer. And therefore, and, and he's answered these questions and and some church just, and some of the members in the, in the, in the church or in Corinth just flatly denied the resurrection. So he was going to great length to, to let this church know that he indeed rose from, from the grave. Because, and, and some of them were teaching, they were spiritualizing the resurrection, saying that it had already passed or had taken place at his death. And you can find that in 2 Timothy 
uh, 17 and 18. And then some were just actually rebelling against the idea of claiming that it was scientifically impossible for, uh, for this uh, miraculous event to take place. It was scientifically impossible because some bodies were maimed. You know, they had these great theaters where uh, they would cast uh, uh, the believers, even uh, as in, in games in the Olympics, they would cast them to lions and, uh, and they would be torn to pieces and maimed. And, uh, and, and so how can this happen? This is scientifically impossible. And some were scattered. Some of the bodies would have been decomposed it's, and it's talking about uh, there's no resurrection from the grave, uh, from the dead. The bodies could be decomposed. So how can this happen in an act of recreation? And in this day, it's pretty prevalent uh, for, and I know this could have been thrown in when we look at, at what is happening in this day. Uh, many people want to be created, uh, I mean, not created, excuse me, uh, cremated. A lot of people want to be cremated. So how then this would fit right into that argument and that mindset could be visited in this day and age. How can this possibly be? Uh, and so the answer, Paul, is simply arguing that the resurrection of Jesus Christ proved uh, the resurrection of the human body. Uh, in fact, Jesus arose so that all men in their full, complete bodies in their persons uh, as well as their spirits could live forever. And, uh, and, and, and not only that, but the resurrection of Jesus Christ make the resurrection of men absolutely certain, absolutely certain. And so this is what we, the challenge that we will have. Uh, again, uh, he, uh, it's a fivefold, the fact of the gospel which proves the resurrection of the Believer of fivefold. So if you're taking notes, I want you to really get this fivefold. Number one, uh, the, that Jesus, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. Scripture is the infallible word of God. And number two, Christ was buried and rose according to the scripture. That's in four. The other one preceded was three. So verse three. And this is verse four. Christ was buried and arose according to the scripture. Verse number three. Uh, fact three, rather. There were eyewitnesses. There were eyewitnesses. And then there was one strong eyewitness. He says, me, Paul, I'm exhibiting it. I'm exhibit A. And then, uh, then the fifth one, there is only one gospel that is preached and has to be believed. You can't understand. Uh, that's what tend to mess us up. We walk by faith and not by sight. You must believe not how you feel about something. It's about belief. It's a mental it's belief, not how you feel, because your feeling will mess you up. Your feelings will mess you up. But it's belief. You got to believe it. And when you believe, that's how you're saved. And we've studied that uh, in Roman and in other uh, scriptures. You must believe that. Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. If you can believe that, and you can be saved. Believe it in your heart. It's a heart issue. Not just a mouth issue, because sometimes you can confess with your mouth and your heart may not be far, can be far from it. So that's, that's, uh, that's just what we must, we must uh, believe and that's what we must deal with. And so then when we uh, continue to, to deal with the proof of the resurrection, uh, the Corinthian uh, doubted it. The Corinthian doubted the resurrection and so Paul is gone now. Uh, to great length, to great length, uh, to prove that. All right. Uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, I ran out of room on the table. Okay. So then, when we look further into into Paul's uh, convincing them, uh, we see that uh, uh, 
we are being, Romans 3 and 24, we just look at that just a minute. Uh, we're being justified freely by his grace uh, through the redemption in Christ Jesus. So it is, it's all about Jesus. So then he wants them to hold on just like we must. We must hold fast and continue to believe uh, and, then, and we can be saved. So that's what he wants us to do, to hold fast. Look what Hebrew 10 and 23 said. Let us hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promises. That's what he's wanting to do. Just hold fast and believe. And look what James 1 and, uh, James 1 and 12 says. I'll just read it. You don't have to look it up. Uh, Blessed is the man that endure temptation, for he is tried. For when he is tried, oh, he's going to be tried, he shall receive a crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Oh, that's, that's awesome. And then, and I like what, what, what he says in verse 5 and 11, James 5 and 11, Behold, we count them happy which endure, because they were wavering. They were wavering. And you will always waver in the faith. Sometimes the situation that you're involved in, the circumstances, uh, you will waver in your faith. Uh, sometimes you go through trials and tribulations and uh, you are knocked to your knees sometimes as long as things are going well. You know, anybody can be strong while things are going well. But then when you're knocked to your knees with situations and circumstances that seem to come out of left field, I've told you before, sometimes trouble can come and, and they just go. But then sometimes trouble will come into your life just like a suitcase coming, indicating that they've come to stay a while. That's why we said weeping and do it for the night, but joy coming in the morning. The issue is, is how long is the night? <laughs> so you know, your night may be a night, uh, a short period, but some nights may last for months. Some nights may last for years. But then uh, it's, uh, it's, it's about trying of our faith and that make us perfect and mature in him. And so then uh, he wants them to understand that Christ is indeed uh, the Passover, uh, the Passover lamb. All right. Um, so then let's, let's look at verse 8 and go through 11. And that will, will probably uh, end our discussion for tonight. And last of all, he says, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, uh, the arm I, that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Look at him. This is out of humility. I'm the least. I was not a part of the 500. I was not a part of the, uh, of the original 12. I'm one that was born out of due season. And uh, I'm considered the least of these uh, uh, apostles uh, because I persecuted the church. I persecuted the church because I've considered myself, as they talked about in, Phil in Philippians, a Hebrew of Hebrew. I'm a blue blood. I'm a child. I'm, I'm uh, uh, from the tribe of Israel. Uh, and and I, uh, I persecuted the church of the living God. But then when I met the master on the Damascus road, and then by grace, he made me an apostle. And so as a result of having made me an apostle, it's by grace that he put me in the ministry. And this is how I am, why I am, because of God's grace. It's always God's grace. And he says, verse 10 says, but, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, we are all what we are. We're all what we are because of the grace of God. And he has bestowed unto me what he has bestowed unto me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Even though I was not with him on these uh, journeys, but I labored more abundantly than all of them. Because I was one that was born out of due season, and it was God's grace. Not me, because I die daily. I die daily. 
it's the God's grace that allowed me to be where I am. I can't be y'all because grace brought me where I am. I'm here because grace brought me. And where I am now, grace is keeping me. And where he's going to take me, grace is going to take me. And so as a result, uh, I, I just, I, I, I love him so much. It is, uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is him who has made me and it's him who is keeping me. And it's him who has brought me to you to teach you. And so uh, uh, he was, uh, it was his ascension. So where we are with this one is there was one strong eyewitness. He says, that's me. I saw him after his ascension too. He was radically changed against all odds. He was radically changed. And he was desperately driven to labor for Christ. I've driven into this labor. And so I did more than them all. And so, uh, 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 and, and verse 11, therefore, whether it were I or they, it doesn't matter who preaches it, whether them or me, so we preach, and so you believe. And so this last fact is, there is only one gospel that is preached and has to be believed. If you don't believe it, then you're hell bound. You must believe it. And so the Old Testament scriptures, as we bring to a close, the Old Testament scripture bore strong prediction concerning the death of God's Messiah. Christ rebuked his disciples for not believing all the prophets had spoken about his death. They didn't believe it. Paul's uh, very method of preaching was to convince people that Jesus Christ was the Messiah who had been uh, predicted in Scripture in the Old Testament. And so when we look at, at, the, at Acts uh, of 17, 2 through 3, and Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them and three Sabbath days Reason with them out of the scripture, of opening and alleging that Christ must need have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, uh, is indeed the Christ. And so we must uh, uh, we must believe in him, and then we must determine not to know. He says, "I am determined not to know anything among you." except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so Paul was a servant of Christ. He was called as an apostle and he was separated unto the gospel of God. Here again, uh, the gospel of God, the good news, which uh, he had promised before by his prophet in the Holy Scripture. And he says, I, I, I have to preach this good news. For it is the power of God unto salvation. Uh, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. And so uh, what we will do uh, going forward, we will uh, start at that 12th verse for next week if the good Lord, you know, is, is willing and uh, which we will deal with that second argument uh, that is the consequences of denying the resurrection. Uh, denying the resurrection because if there is a denial of the resurrection, then our preaching is empty, our witness is, uh, is empty, and our faith is empty. And so Paul saw Christ uh, after the Lord's uh, ascension. And uh, so uh, he is one who was uh, born out of, out of due season. It means uh, um, sort of like a miscarriage again, an abortion, an, uh, an unnatural birth, a child born out of time. So this is who he said he is and uh, that he is the least of those and that uh, he is, uh, but he did more than them all. And so, uh, my sisters and brothers, as we prepare now 
uh, to leave you. We ask that you would uh, study ahead. And as you study ahead, uh, then we'll be prepared to go forward with this in this great chapter. Uh, because all that Paul was and all that Paul did was by grace. And so we are, and we are in this age of grace. We are in the dispensation of grace. And so Paul, as Paul labored diligently, so must we. We must labor diligently. And the labor, that just means to labor to point uh, others to Christ. Uh, and sometimes we get wearied and we get exhausted, but we can get tired in the Word, but we never get tired of the Word. And so uh, as we labor, never bit get weary in well-doing, for in due season, you will reap if you faint not. And so uh, I, I want you to uh, read on ahead. And as we read on ahead, uh, we will deal with uh, uh, the, the fact that uh, uh, if you deny the resurrection, uh, there are consequences in denying the resurrection that Christ has not risen. And, uh, and our preaching again, and it's empty. Our faith is empty and our witness is empty. And uh, we uh, will be lying about God and, uh, and bearing witness against God if that be the case. So uh, 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 let us you know, go forward as we move uh, in, the, in, the, in the word and go further into uh, this great resurrection chapter. All right, let's have a word of prayer and then... Um, uh, we will bid you good night. God, our Father, we thank you for this time of sharing. We thank you for uh, for your word. We thank you for uh, this time, oh God, as we uh, study your word. May we not only be hearers and learners, but we'll be doers of the word. Keep us safe from the storm, oh God. Uh, keep us in the hollow of your own hand. Keep us in your, in your pavilion, in your keeping power. Uh, for we are the sheep of your Pastor, we bless you, we love you, we magnify your name. It is the name of him who is our Christ. We do pray. Amen.